Good morning, students and teachers. Welcome. Today's uh, February 22nd, uh, 2022. It's a big two day. It's 2 22 22. Uh, we're very excited to have our latest. Um, our latest, I'm sorry, our latest uh, episode of Cyber Mentoring. And we're very excited to invite uh, Miss Mary O'Neill to join us. Hello. And since it's Heart Month, we're going to talk about uh, cardiac care. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Uh, Mary, welcome. We're very excited to have you here. I do want to remind everyone that this is being recorded and will be available later on on YouTube. So welcome. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. And I am super excited to talk to all of y'all. I wish I could see everyone's faces, but I've been a part of a lot of the PADS conferences. So I've probably run into a lot of y'all and I'm super happy to be here. So I will tell you a little bit about me to start off with and how I got into nursing. And then um, I will talk about my absolute favorite conversation anything related to cardiology, about the heart, and, and how our bodies are so beautifully and intricately made. So I'm going to start off by um, sharing my screen a little bit so um, y'all can see our PowerPoint presentation. So let me go down here. There you go. Okay. And then let me scroll back up to the beginning. So um, I'll actually just start with talking a little bit about me. Can y'all see me too or just my screen? We can see both. Okay, great. Um, so I can just see my screen. So I, but good that y'all can see me. So again, my name is Mary O'Neill. Um, I'm from Clifton, Virginia, but I've been in Texas for almost six years and I've been a nurse for almost 12 years. Um, I always wanted to be a nurse since I was a little kid, which is probably unusual, but I think I've always just been fascinated with how our bodies work. And I had this amazing biology teacher when I was in ninth grade, um, shout out to Mr. Misenchek, but he just presented our bodies the way that we were made in our anatomy and our physiology in such a beautiful way that I just knew I wanted to do something with people. And then I think I've also just always been someone who wanted to work in a career where I felt like I was doing something tangibly impactful, like actually making a difference. And as that can sometimes sound cliche, I have felt so fulfilled in nursing and in different types of nursing as I've kind of progressed along my career. Um, how long did it take me to become a nurse? So um, I finished high school when I was 17 and I went to University of Virginia and that was a four-year program for bachelors. So you have a lot of other courses in addition to nursing courses, but our last two years of that of nursing school was very heavily focused on primarily just nursing courses where we had a lot of time in clinicals and in the hospital. And then our university was affiliated with um, the University of Virginia Hospital so that we were able to have a lot of privileges and be able to have um, actually a wing of the hospital that only the nursing students took care of those patients. And then the registered nurses that worked in the hospital would come and sign off and kind of uh, monitor our work. But we were able to take a lot of the responsibility and a lot of the care duties for those patients, which just really led to to a lot of growth and um, really enjoyed that. So that was four years. And then um, recently I went back and I graduated in the spring with uh, my family nurse practitioner degree at a and and that was a three-year program. So this kind of went a little bit um, into this slide as well. So I went to University of Virginia and Texas A&M and total of seven years of school, but the first um, four was for my bachelor's and then the last three was for my master's degree. Um, how did I pay for school? So uh, my parents helped me with my undergraduate degree. They helped pay for that. I paid for some of it, but they helped pay for that as well. Um, and I nannied throughout undergrad to pay a lot of my bills. Um, and when you're in college, you're always kind of living your, your paycheck to paycheck because no one in undergrad school has um, you know, any high paying jobs. But I think I really enjoyed nannying that I, I, it made me feel like I was really connected to our community and I was able to help and really feel a part of a lot of the families that I worked with. What was the hardest part of my schooling and program? 
So I think um, speaking most recently in graduate school, um, balancing everything. So um, I was working full time in my current position as a nurse educator and then also attending graduate school and then trying to complete clinical hours as well. So it ended up being a lot to um, just to make sure that I'm putting prioritizing my life in a way that um, I'm putting adequate effort and focus into what's really important. Um, and then I also have hobbies too. So I, I love to do triathlons and I'm training with a couple friends. We did um, Waco Ironman and then we're going to do Galveston Ironman um, triathlon this spring in a few weeks. So um, that's always time consuming as well. So I think um, one of the most challenging things about me is that I really wanted to be able to be a part of everything and do everything really well. And you realize that you have to put something as the primary focus. So uh, my last year of school, my third year in, in my graduate program, I went part-time at work. So I was able to spend a little bit more time um, to focus on school because I knew that that would have such a big impact on my future. And I really wanted to not just get through school, but get through school and be successful and really, really learn and, and um, take out what you actually put in. Okay, what does a normal day look like for you and what other professionals do I interact with and skills for success in my profession? So a normal day, I have had several jobs, um, three jobs, and a normal day has looked differently in all of them. So right now I'm a nurse educator and my day looks different all the time. Um, you know, from during the, the height of the pandemic where we were uh, picking up shifts in our COVID unit and you're there for 12 hour days and really just helping as much as you can with the patients um, to, right now, you know, working with y'all or working with other conferences, we teach our nurses. So we, um, I'm assigned to the telemetry unit, which is the cardiac unit, no surprise. Um, but in that, I'm able to work with um, so many of our new nurses and really help to build curriculum, guide and mentor them um, and, and really make sure that their skills are progressing, that their critical thinking is progressing and that they're feeling supported in that new role. There's such a really big transition um, emotionally, maturity wise, and then also just skills wise, going from nursing school to uh, um, working on the floors with real life patients whose um, life is quite literally in your hands. Um, and it can feel overwhelming in a lot of different levels. So I think um, in order to be successful and in order to really support those nurses, we need to have a good team to be able to mentor them and help them grow, not just in their understanding of pharmacology and physiology and pathologies, but also in how to do the daily, the day-to-day -day skills and the procedures that we do on our floor. I'm clicking my, I have two computers in front of me, so I'm clicking the wrong one sometimes. That's so, true. um, I'm going to move on into a little bit about the heart, um, unless y'all have any questions right now for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the chat feature. So if you okay. do have um, questions as the presentation is going on, you can put them in the chat. And as Mary just did, we'll um, pause every once in a while and check the chat to see if anybody has any questions so it's the chat okay. open for you to put any questions you might have okay and maybe you can flag me if someone puts a question in the chat because right now on my screen I can just see my PowerPoint I can because I'm sharing the screen so just let me know and then I can escape so I can read the um the questions too don't worry about it. I'll read the question off to you okay perfect okay yeah. so first um what is the whole point of our cardiopulmonary system our cardiopulmonary system talks about the heart and the lungs. So cardio referring to the heart, pulmonary referring to our lungs. So we're considering organs such as our heart, all of our blood vessels when we're talking about the cardiovascular system. And then our pulmonary system is gonna be our lungs and all of our airways that contribute to that. So our cardiopulmonary system, the whole reason we have this is to bring oxygen to every single cell in our body. We know that our body is made up of cells at the smallest level, right? And then um, groups of cells make up tissues, groups of tissues make up organs, and then groups of organs make up organ systems. But at the cellular level, every single cell needs oxygen to fuel all life-sustaining processes. And our cardiopulmonary system is what does that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy of the heart. 
how the heart works, both structurally and electrophysiologically wise. And then we'll talk a little bit about some diseases of the heart and how we manage those diseases, what we look for in that, and then basic nursing care. I would love to make this interesting to y'all. So if y'all have specific questions, please put them in the chat so that I can make sure to address any um, anything that y'all have, have uh, for me. So first, the reason all of our cells need oxygen is to go through cellular respiration to create ATP, which is the chemical currency or the chemical energy for all the processes that our cells will go through. And I teach a class called hemodynamics and hemodynamics is broken down into heme is blood and dynamics is movement. So hemodynamics is the study of how blood moves through our body. We know that our blood is what actually delivers oxygen to all of our tissues. Every red blood cell has 270 million hemoglobin molecules and every hemoglobin molecule binds four oxygen molecules. And that's what actually gets delivered to those capillary beds and drops off those oxygen molecules to our tissues. So we can have a lot of reasons where we have inadequate oxygenation of our tissues, whether that is a heart problem or a lung problem. If I have a lung problem and I'm not getting good oxygen transition into my blood, which we'll talk about in a little bit, then I'm gonna have low blood oxygen levels and I'll deliver less oxygen to my tissues. But if I have a heart problem and I'm not pumping blood throughout my body correctly, then I'm also gonna have reduced oxygen delivery. So our cardiopulmonary system is the basic functional component that maintains life. And what's so cool to understand is how many neurohormonal and how many mechanisms within our body are going into constantly regulating and maintaining these systems to keep this beautiful homeostatic balance. Because we know that we have different metabolic demands, whether you're at rest. So right now I'm sitting in a chair talking to y'all and I have very low metabolic demand. But if I am, for example, this weekend, I'm biking with two of my friends and we're doing the jalapeno 100k bike ride and mm -hmm. we're excited to just bike hard and really train hard for this we're using it as a training race for our triathlon and if i'm biking 67 miles i'm going to need a ton more blood flow and a ton more oxygen delivery to every single cell in my body because you think about your quads and your glutes and your arms and everything you're using all the muscles that you're activating and how much increase those oxygen demands are and I don't have to consciously tell my body to have a faster, more forceful heartbeat or to breathe faster to improve the oxygen delivery. My body has all these little chemical and hormonal sensors that really activate to make sure that my tissues receive the oxygen that they need, whether I'm at rest or whether I am in, under intense duress. Um, at rest, our tissues receive about three to four times the amount of oxygen that they need. So what that means is when the arteries bring blood to all of my tissues, my tissues get way more than they need. And they're only using about 25% of it. So the blood that returns back to my heart in my veins still has an oxygen level of about 75%. So we have a lot of leftover oxygen. But in critical illness or in time periods of stress on your body, your demand increases, meaning all of your tissues will need a lot more oxygen, and then your supply will often start to drop in different types of illnesses. So you'll have this supply demand imbalance, which can cause tissue hypoxia or cells that are suddenly not uh, receiving enough oxygen to meet their life-sustaining goals. And those cells can start to swell and die and go through something called apoptosis where they die, right? And so when we have groups of cells that are dying off, we call this tissue ischemia and eventually tissue infarction. And that's where we can go into, we can progress into multi-organ failure and, and death. And in the hospital, we're dealing with so many different types of patients, but what we are really trained with as nurses is to identify early signs of decline in our patient. And so we'll talk a little bit about our nervous systems and then how our heart is structured and then how we can recognize those signs of decline as nurses in order to improve early identification, early intervention and better care for our patients, which ultimately optimizes their outcomes. So the heart, 
Y'all, I could talk to you about the heart all day, <laughs> all night. And I only have an hour, but I really could go on forever. I love learning about the heart. It was my favorite clinical and nursing school. Um, I teach a four hour EKG class and then I teach a three hour advanced EKG class. And I love to teach anyone who will come listen to me talk about the heart. Trust me, I'm there and I'm ready to talk about it. That's but I'm what we're here for, it. so great. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'm super excited. Um, so we're, I'm gonna break it down to um, a little bit of a basic level and then try to build on that because I don't know where everyone is in their um, classes with anatomy and physiology and kind of what y'all know so far. So we talked about how the whole purpose of your heart and your lungs is to bring oxygen to all of your tissues and your heart serves as the pump. You receive venous blood. The venous blood is all the blood that's low in oxygen and high in CO2 because CO2 or carbon dioxide is the waste product of cellular metabolism. So your blood, the, the venous blood, remember veins bring blood back to your heart. Arteries carry blood away from your heart. So venous blood brings all that used up blood back to your heart and it's low in oxygen, high in CO2. When it comes back to the heart, the right side of the heart is going to send that blood to the lungs. And so when the right side of the heart sends that blood to the lungs, we end up having gas exchange. And that gas exchange happens from a simple partial pressure gradient. So what does that look like? Can y'all see my mouse right now? Yes, we can. Okay, so I said all the blood comes back to your heart into the right side of your heart and it collects in the right atrium. And it does that through your veins. And so the veins all merge into the central veins. So right here, this is a central vein. This is called the superior um, vena cava. And this vein right here is called the inferior vena cava. And these are the central veins that bring blood back to your heart. So all of the, everything above my heart, so my head, my arms, everything up here, the blood, the venous blood will drain back into my superior vena cava and everything below my heart, my abdominal cavity, my legs, all the way down to my toes, all that venous blood will drain back into my inferior vena cava. But the right atrium is going to be the collecting chamber for all that blood that's low in oxygen and high in CO2. That blood in the heart should only travel in a one way blood flow. So I should only have blood flowing from the right atrium down to the right ventricle. Okay, so the blood, should, I'm finding my mouse, there we are. So the blood should only travel from here down to the right ventricle. I should never have blood go back up to the inferior or superior vena cava. I should only flow forward. So the blood from the right atrium is gonna flow down to that right ventricle. When my right ventricle contracts and pumps, it's gonna pump blood forward through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. Remember, arteries carry blood away from the heart. So the right side of the heart, we see that blood represented as blue because deoxygenated blood will appear blue. Oxygenated blood appears bright red. And y'all know this because if you look at your veins and your arms, you'll see how the blood looks blue in your veins. But if you cut yourself, um, yeah, I don't know, you fall off your bike or something and you have a big cut on yourself, the blood that comes out is bright red, right? Because it's exposed to oxygen. So oxygenated blood is bright red and venous blood or deoxygenated blood is gonna look blue. So in our picture here, we see the blue venous blood goes to the right atrium down to that right ventricle. That right ventricle contracts, it goes into the pulmonary artery and it goes to the lungs. So remember, when that blood flows through the lungs, that's when we're actually going to have gas exchange. So what happens there? Well, when I breathe in air, I bring air all the way to the functional parenchyma or the functional units of my lungs, which is called the alveolar sacs. And they look like clumps of grapes. But if you were to expand them all out, they would take up over a tennis field. They're incredibly big, okay? So... If I were to expand all that, we have so much area and that's called surface area, which we can use for gas exchange. So what I have is I have these alveolar sacs, which are filled with air, air that I breathe in from out here, from, from our room or from outdoors, that's high in oxygen. So I have this air in my lung that's high in oxygen and I have this blood that's flowing through that wraps around that air sac and just has a simple squamous epithelial layer or a thin membrane between those two, uh, between the blood and between the air sac. And so that's where we have gas exchange from low oxygen levels in my blood and high oxygen levels in my lungs. So what happens is that oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream 
And now that blood in my lungs on the other side of the capillary bed is gonna be bright red and well oxygenated. So now we have some bright red, happy blood that we want to send everywhere. And it's gonna return back to my heart into my left atrium, okay? So the left side of the heart is gonna receive all the oxygenated blood and the right side of the heart is gonna receive all the deoxygenated blood. So when that blood comes back to the left atrium, that left atrium will contract and blood will flow down to the left ventricle. And then that left ventricle contracts, pumps blood out through here, through the aorta. And that's where blood goes throughout my entire body and it pumps blood everywhere. And all day, every day, this is happening. So the four chambers in my heart, both of my atrium, those, the top two chambers, my right atrium, my left atrium, they will contract together. And then my right ventricle and my left ventricle, they will contract together. But all day, every day, I have atrial, then ventricular contraction, atrial, then ventricular contraction. And that's what pumps blood forward. This is also why we feel a pulse. So I'm going to have y'all feel your carotid pulse with me. So if you feel your trachea right here, and then slide into that little groove either on the right or the left. And I'm gonna have y'all feel your pulse. So if y'all are nervous, maybe your pulse is really fast. And if y'all are just relaxed or maybe you're bored by my talk, then maybe your heart's really slow. But when y'all feel your pulse, what you're feeling is your thick muscular artery expanding and recoiling, expanding and recoiling. And the reason it's expanding and recoiling is because blood is surging through, surging through, surging through. So as that blood goes through, that the volume or the, or the, um, the circumference of that artery is going to expand to allow for that increased volume and then recoil back down to its pre-volume size. And that's why we feel a pulse. So that's why we only feel pulses in our arteries. We don't feel pulses in our veins because they will just drain back up to our heart. So we have two periods in our heart, if we simplify it, and that's called systole and diastole. Systole refers to the simultaneous, simultaneous being same time, simultaneous contraction of bilateral ventricles. So what does that mean? That means my right ventricle and my left ventricle, the bottom part of my heart is gonna contract and pump blood forward. That's called systole. So the period during which those ventricles contract and eject blood is systole. Diastole is the simultaneous relaxation or recovery and filling of those ventricles. Because in order to pump blood, I need to have blood in those chambers to pump. So during diastole, I'm going to relax and fill and the atrium will drop blood down to the ventricles. And then during systole, those ventricles will contract and pump that blood forward. In a normal person with a normal heart rate, your systolic period will be about half the time of your diastolic period. That means that your ventricles spend more time relaxed than they do contracting, okay? so. You can hear this when we listen to heart sounds and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But when we listen to someone's heart, we hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. The time between lub and dub, that's systole. That's the time your heart's squeezing. The time between dub and then that next lub, that's diastole, when you're relaxing and filling. Okay, so systole squeeze, diastole relax and fill. Again, that diastolic period is really, really important. Why is that diastolic period important? Because if we don't fill well, if we have a shortened diastolic period and we don't fill well, we're not gonna pump as much blood forward. Why? Because each time I pump, I'm gonna pump less blood because I did not fill as full. Kind of like if you imagine filling up um, a bucket of water. If I spend a long time filling up that bucket of water and then I throw that bucket out, I'm gonna throw out a lot of water. If I just turn the faucet on for a second and then turn it off and throw the bucket out, I only throw out a little bit of water. So longer diastolic periods are gonna give you more filling, which gives you more blood flow forward, which we call stroke volume. Another thing that I wanna explain about this diagram is going to be the walls of the heart, okay? And we call that the, the endocardium, the myocardium, and the epicardium. So I'm gonna focus on the myocardium, which is that muscular layer around the heart. And what I want y'all to notice is how the atrium have a much thinner wall. So see this atrial wall, how it's much thinner than those ventricles. The ventricles have a really thick muscle mass. 
And that thick muscle mass is really important. So if y'all think about it for a minute, why would you think that the atrial wall does not need to be as strong or as thick as the ventricular wall? If we just think about that for a moment. Well, the reason is the ventricles have a lot more resistance to overcome to eject that blood. The atrium only have to drop blood down to the ventricles. The ventricles have to pump against a lot of resistance. So let's talk about that right ventricle first. So that right ventricle has to pump against the resistance of the pulmonary artery and the lungs, okay? So he has to pump hard to forcefully expel that, that uh, blood out. The left ventricle has to pump against even more pressure, significantly more pressure. The left ventricle has to pump against the resistance of the aorta and systemic circulation. So that would be the resistance of a normal person's blood pressure. So if I go to the dentist or the doctor and they grab my, I thought about the dentist because I just went to the dentist yesterday <laughs> and they took my blood pressure. But if really anywhere you go get your blood pressure and they grab your blood pressure and it's uh, 120 over 80, because that would be a textbook normal blood pressure. But if you go grab your blood pressure, that is how much force or how much, how tight or, or how, how much resistance your ventricles have to overcome to get that blood out. That's one of the reasons that high blood pressure is really hard on your heart. Because think about my poor little left ventricle. So I'm pointing to my left ventricle. Let me see if I can see my mouse. Here's my left ventricle. So when my left ventricle pumps, he pumps blood throughout my entire body. But if my blood vessels are really calcified and stiff and clamping down really, really tight, my LV has to pump so hard all day, every day to get that blood out. But if I have very healthy, compliant, relaxed blood vessels, then all day, every day, my LV is like, oh, this is easy. I'm living the life. <laughs> he doesn't have to work hard at all. He just does his thing. So we can think whose heart's going to last longer, someone with healthy blood pressure and healthy blood vessel, or someone who has high blood pressure and calcified damaged blood vessels. Well, it's the person who has healthy blood vessels. That person is going to have a much easier workload on that heart, which is going to prevent remodeling and restructuring and physiologic damage to that cardiac structure. And we'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about heart failure. I'm just going to look at the time to make sure I've got, I want to You're keep going like eight hours. I'm doing great. I I so, um, but that left ventricle has a lot of resistance to overcome. And I'll also point out that that left ventricle is pressure is going to be a lot higher than that right ventricular pressure. So your right ventricle does not have to work as hard as your left ventricle. Your pulmonary arteries blood pressure should be very low in a person with healthy lungs. So we don't think about taking the blood pressure of your pulmonary artery, right? When we think about taking a blood pressure, we think about your brachial artery where they put the cuff around your arm, right? So that measures the, the pressure in your systemic vessels, which would implicate how much resistance that left ventricle has to work to get that blood out. But when we want to think about how hard does our right ventricle have to work, we have to look at the pressure here in our pulmonary artery. So we have invasive ways in the hospital that we can't do at home, but in the hospital where we can put this little catheter and measure the pressure in that pulmonary artery. And the, the pulmonary artery pressure should be about what I like to teach is quarters over dimes, about 25 over 10. So what that means is that right ventricle wor works against a resistance of 25 over 10, 25 over 10. Whereas that left ventricle works against resistance of 120 over 80, 120 over 80. So that left ventricle has to work really hard all day, every day in comparison to that right ventricle. And that comes into play in a lot of different things. And I'll point out one, which we'll get into in a little bit, but when we talk about heart attacks. So heart attacks, which we call myocardial infarction or an MI, heart attacks happen from a reduced blood supply to the heart. And there are five different ways that can happen, but the most common one is called type one. And what I just wanna point out here is the most common place for that heart attack to happen is on the left side of the heart. It's definitely possible to have a right-sided MI, but it's much more common to have a left-sided MI. And one of the big reasons for the left-sided MI is that the left side of the heart has much higher oxygen demand. 
Why? He's working way harder. And I told y'all that when I bike jalapeno this weekend, my heart's got to work a lot harder than it is me sitting here relaxing, talking to y'all. I can just, my heart, it's just resting and I'm relaxing, right? But when I'm going to start working hard, my heart's going to have to work really hard. So if someone has a left-sided MI or a left-sided heart attack, they only need to have a small reduction in blood flow to have a really noticeable impact. Whereas on the right side of the heart, they don't need as much oxygen and they can function okay. And because they don't utilize as much oxygen, so that imbalance between a slight oxygen deprivation won't be as dramatic or as severe. So a couple things I wanted to point out. Now we'll move on a little bit. We're gonna talk a little bit about heart valves. And y'all please put questions in the chat if there's specific things that y'all would love to discuss that I'm not discussing yet. So heart valves. The purpose of valves in our heart, and we have four of them, the purpose of our valves is to promote one-way blood flow. So they're, these, they're structured like little leaflets, which y'all can see here in this picture, but they're little leaflets. And when, blood, when, when they're open, the blood's gonna flow through them really well, but then they slam shut and, the, and they act like a little wall or a door and the blood cannot come backwards. And the reason we want this is I told you that blood should only flow forward throughout our heart. So if I scroll back, I should only have blood coming from my right atrium to right ventricle to pulmonary artery and then back to the left side of my heart, left atrium, left ventricle, um, aorta and out. I should never have blood that comes down here and goes back up here, right? Why? Because I have a valve here. So when that RV contracts, this valve right here, he will be closed. So the only way that blood can go is through this open valve. So when my when this valve right here, which is called the tricuspid valve, when this valve is closed during systole, when my heart is squeezing, that blood's going to flow forward through the only open pathway, which is going to be through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. So during systole, when my ventricle squeezes, the only direction blood can flow is this way forward, because what I don't want to happen is for blood to flow backwards. But during diastole, I'm resting right? So I'm, I want that ventricle to fill and recover, right? So I need this blood to be able to flow into here. So what's going to happen? The semilunar or pulmonic valve is going to close because I don't want blood dropping back in from this way. I only want blood dropping in from this way. So my tricuspid valve opens and my pulmonic valve closes so that blood will only flow down this way. And the same thing happens on this side of the heart. During diastole, when I'm filling, my mitral valve will be open so blood can fill into my ventricle, but my aortic valve will be closed so I don't get backflow of blood. And then during systole, when I'm squeezing, I only want to squeeze blood forward. So my aortic valve will open so blood can go forward. At the same time, my mitral valve slams shut so blood does not flow backwards. So that's why we are able to have forward blood flow. Again, that's also what produces sound in our hearts. So if y'all use a stethoscope and you listen to someone's heart, what you're going to hear is that lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. And we're not hearing pumping. We're hearing valves slam shut, valves slam shut. That's what actually creates the sound that we are listening to when we hear the lub dub. And we call that S1 and S2. And as I talked about earlier, the time between S1 and S2 is systole when that heart is actually squeezing and pumping that blood forward. The time between S2 and that next S1 is diastole when those, when, when those ventricles are open and the blood is going to be flowing through what I call my atrioventricular valves, which include my tricuspid valve and my mitral valve. So during diastole, the chambers are going to fill and my atrioventricular valves will be open so that blood can fill my ventricles, but my semilunar valves, which include the aortic and pulmonic, will be closed. That way, blood does not flow backwards down here. And then during systole, when I squeeze, I want to close off my AV valves so that blood cannot flow, or we call that regurgitate, back up to my atrium, but it can only flow out the arteries that it's supposed to flow out. Now, we can have people with a lot of different types of valve problems, and that can lead to regurgitant blood flow. So if my valve doesn't fully slam shut, but it only partially slams shut, 
then, and I'm going to give you an example. So a really common valve to have problems is going to be the mitral valve. So let's say my mitral valve doesn't slam shut all the way. So it's leaky and we call that a regurgitant valve. So during systole, when my left ventricle is squeezing, blood will flow forward out my aorta, but some blood is also going to regurgitate backwards up to that left atrium. And when that happens, that left atrium is going to swell and get bigger. And the bad part about that is when that left atrium starts to swell, the blood starts to leak back into the pulmonary veins and we end up getting excess pressure in that pulmonary circuit and you get fluid on your lungs. So we see these people come to the hospital with shortness of breath, having trouble breathing because they have so much fluid on their lungs from a problem with their mitral valve. And there are a lot of other reasons to have fluid in their lungs, but that's one of the big things, one of the big consequences. And then if it's really severe, if it's a really turbulent blood flow, not only do we have fluid on the lungs, but we start getting a, lot, a big reduction in forward blood flow. Why? Because the blood isn't just flowing forwards, it's flowing forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. So because it's also flowing backwards, we're having less of that blood ejecting forwards. So if I have less forward blood flow, I'm going to feel dizzy. I'm going to have less organ perfusion, right? And so you're going to have a lot worsened outcomes in your patient. Okay, so I put this little diagram. I know that y'all probably don't have stethoscopes in school, but um, <laughs> I put this diagram to show you different places that we can listen to the heart. And what's kind of cool is we know that the heart sits in the left side of my chest, right? So it sits kind of right here on the left side of my chest and goes down towards my apex. This is my apex right over here. So um, when I listen to my heart, listening over different areas in the, uh, over the chest, you can hear different valves better. And so what's cool about that is if I know I have a patient today and my patient has aortic valve problems, I know where to listen on their chest, right? Their second intercostal space, right sternal border. I'm gonna listen right here. And I can best hear the weird turbulent blood flow, which is called a murmur. And it's just really fun to actually be able to appreciate those murmurs and listen to them in real life when you get to match what's, on, what's in the patient's chart with their all their past medical history from different ultrasounds and different tests that they've done on the heart to what your actual clinical assessment is looking at those patients and seeing those disease processes manifest in what you hear and what you see and what you touch on your patient. It's just a really cool link and such an awesome way to learn. It's also kind of interesting too, if you listen to your um, different heart areas and you can figure out which valve is giving you problems based on whether you hear the turbulent blood flow, which will sound like a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Cause it, your heart, your heart sounds should sound like lub -dub, lub -dub, lub -dub. but sometimes they'll sound like whoosh dub, whoosh dub, whoosh dub whoosh da, or da whoosh, da whoosh, da whoosh, right? So you'll hear these whoosh sounds and depending on where that weird slurred sound is and what part of the cardiac cycle it happens, you know if it's called a systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur. So that can narrow down which valves are giving you problems and which ones we need to intervene on. Obviously then they, they don't just take our listening to, to do surgery on the patient. When the patients need surgery, they'll do a lot of other tests on those patients as well, including an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of that heart to look at those valves and to see how they're functioning. I have a question. So oh, yes. I know in theory, I mean, I know that your heart is a lot lower, but why do they listen higher up on your body when they're listening? And also, why do they listen on your back when you go get a checkup? Good. Very good questions. So first, why do they listen higher up? Essentially, the way that the blood flows or the way the arteries eject blood will cause sound to reverberate in different directions. So the locations on which on the chest that we listen to um, are, are points of maximum auscultation, right? So you can hear the heart. If we had a perfectly silent room and no ambient noise and the patient held their breath, we could hear amazing heart sounds probably anywhere on the chest. 
but we always have alarms beeping, stuff going on, monitors, equipment, patients breathing, other things that will kind of confound your assessment. And so listening to these areas, essentially where the, and based on the direction the blood is flowing, will cause sounds to emanate in different directions and they're best heard in different areas in the chest. So higher up in the chest, you'll hear the aortic and pulmonic area, meaning you can hear those valves better. But the best place usually is right here to listen to the heart. I think with women, sometimes it's harder because you, if you have a large chest, it can be hard. You have to kind of go under the breast to be able to listen well, because the sound doesn't try and um, conduct well through fatty tissue, which is what your breasts are, right? So right. listening through your, your breast tissue or, or a bra is going to be a lot more challenging. And then why do we listen to the back? The back is going to be your lung sounds, not your heart sounds, mm -hmm. unless you had some type of posterior displacement or um, like a, a congenital abnormal heart location. Um, so there are people who have their heart on the right side or, or really abnormal um, congenital problems with their heart. But the, the lungs are best heard on the back of your chest because when you inhale, your lungs um, bring in air in and they're, they're a lot closer to your back essentially mm -hmm. than they are to your chest. So when they, when they listen to your back, they're usually going to have you breathe in, breathe out. Whereas when they listen right. to your chest, sometimes they'll listen to your lungs on your chest too, but we hear them a lot better on the back. So a lot of times when we listen to your chest, we won't have you breathe in and breathe out. In reality, I would love to tell when patients just hold their breath, but I don't do that. <laughs> so I listen and I kind of ignore the lung sounds when I'm trying, and you tune into just those cardiac sounds that you're listening for. So you get good at kind of just like anyone is, you know, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a mom, I can totally tune out my kids sometimes. So <laughs> you get good at what you're, what you're listening for and what you, um, and, and what you're trying to hear. Does that answer that? Yes, it did. Also, you started okay. talking about EKG. So that I want to know more about EKGs. Awesome. Okay. So I can, I'll fast forward a little bit to that and then we can come back a little bit. So okay. I'll go forward um, to this one. I know that we're, I'm, oh my goodness, it's 1042. What? Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> we only have three hours left, y'all. I'm just kidding. We're good. Um, okay. We're good. Okay. So um, I, what is an EKG? So we have electricity in our heart. I know mind blown, right? But we have current in our heart. And what that current does is that current causes muscular contraction. So I told you that your ventricles contract to pump blood, but what causes them to contract? What causes them to contract is current or electricity. So in your heart, you have two primary types of cells, muscle cells and electrical cells. The muscle cells actually have those little actin myosin filaments and those sarcomeres with the little cross bridges and they go boom, boom, right? And that's what actually causes contraction. The electrical cells do not contract. They only conduct current. But when they conduct current, they cause the muscles to contract. In the absence of current, the muscles will not contract in the heart. So you have to have current flowing through your heart to cause muscular contraction. So why do we have current in our heart? We have current in our heart due to the flow of ions in and out of the cells. So this is very similar to neuronal action potential. So I don't know, again, where everyone is in their <laughs> kind of um, anatomy, but just like we talk about how neurons are firing, causing neuromuscular. So when I lift my arm or anything, it's from a brain sending messages through the nervous system to activate a muscle. Very similar in your heart. We call them cardiac action potentials. And what's happening is our cell has a lot inside our cardiac cell. There are a lot more anions inside and cations outside. So anions and cations. Anions are negatively charged. Cations are positively charged, okay? So I always remember that because remember only electrons can go back and forth, not the protons. So um, for a cation, you, a cat clawed away an electron. So now he's positive. So when you take away an electron, you're gonna be positive. And then an anion, A for add. If you add an electron, now you're negative, right? Because mm -hmm. you have an extra electron. So anions are negative, cations are positive. So I have more anions, meaning my, my cardiac cells are really negative inside and positive on the outside. So, and that, that creates something called um, a, a resting membrane potential or a current gradient between the number of ions inside and outside the, outside the um, cell, which is about negative 60 to negative 90 millivolts. Again, that's just the gradient difference between the current inside and the current outside of the heart, uh, of the um or the, the ions inside and the ions outside of the cardiac cells. So what happens to create current is these little ion channels open and they're voltage gated. And what they do is they allow sodium, which is a cation. So sodium is Na plus, if we think about our periodic table, sodium rushes into the cell. 
And so you have a ton of sodium rushing into the cell. And when that sodium comes into the cell, the cell now goes from being negative to positive. And that's called depolarization, which causes the excitation of that cell, which then causes the excitation of the neighbor cell and the neighbor cell and the neighbor cell and the neighbor cell. So um, as you have that depolarization, you're going to have, that's going to later create muscular contraction. So let me relate that to an EKG. When we do an EKG, which is an electrocardiogram, all we are doing is looking at the current flowing through your heart. So I'm just looking at electricity. I'm not looking at your valves. I'm not looking at your muscles. I'm not looking at your chamber size. I'm solely looking at what current is flowing through your heart. What looks at the structural component of our heart is typically what we call an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram is an ultrasound of your heart. And they can do that on top of your chest where they just put some jelly on your chest and they'll use a little ultrasound probe and, and look at your heart. Or they can do it transesophageally where they put, you have to sedate you a little bit and they put a tube down your esophagus and they look at your heart that way. And it's a better picture because your esophagus goes right by your left atrium. So obviously if I were to pick, I'd want to transthoracic because that sounds yeah. a lot more pleasant than <laughs> something on my esophagus. Agreed. But that's how they look at the structural component. An EKG solely looks at electricity. But what is so cool about EKGs is that they tell you so much about the structure of your heart. So looking at an EKG, I can look at it and I can say, you have a large left, you likely, I should say likely, have a large left ventricle or you have a large left atrium or you're having an MI in this location, a heart attack in this location, or you're having abnormal current, which is creating this abnormal rhythm. You can garner so much information from an EKG. I can see the sign that a patient has a heart attack, has heart failure, has um, congenital abnormalities, has um you know, altered electrical current congenitally. So you can see so much from an EKG. And the classic EKG we do is called a 12 lead EKG. So break that down, 12 leads. What we actually do is we put 10 electrodes on a patient. And the electrodes you can think of, they look like little gel stickers. And maybe you all have seen this like either in a movie mm -hmm. or in real life, but um, we put six stickers on the chest and we call those V1 through V6. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we put six stickers, stickers on the chest and then we have four more because it's 10 total stickers. And those each go on the limbs. So one on my right arm, one on my left arm, one on my right leg, one, one on my left leg. And that will give me 10 different electrodes that will produce 12 leads. A lead is simply a view. And what you're viewing from is a negative pole to a positive pole. So essentially all these electrodes can act as negative or positive poles. And what you're looking at, for example, I'll tell you about the most basic lead. The most basic lead that we typically look at that we teach from is lead two. Lead two looks from my right arm electrode to my left leg electrode. So it's looking this way in my heart, this way in my heart. And that happens to be the direction that current flows in my heart. Current flows from my right atrium and the bulk of the current goes down towards my left ventricle. Why? My right atrium has an electrical node called the sinoatrial node, which is where all current in a healthy, normal heart should start. That's why we call a normal heart rhythm sinus rhythm or mm -hmm. sinus tachycardia or sinus bradycardia because it starts in the sinoatrial node. So all of your cardiac current should start in my right atrium. And then the bulk of that current conducts down to my left ventricle. Why? My left ventricle has the largest muscle mass and essentially needs more, it's greedy and pulls more of that current to cause whole wall contraction. What I don't want when my heart gets stimulated is just some of that heart wall contracting. I want the whole wall to efficiently and forcefully contract to forcefully eject blood forward. We do not want inefficient contractions. Inefficient contractions will lead to a lot of different problems, which will alter forward blood flow and your patient will be symptomatic. They'll have low blood pressure, which we call hypotension. So they're going to feel dizzy, short of breath, chest pain. They're going to look pale, sweaty. They'll look horrible, right? So we want really efficient, forceful blood flow. So an EKG on lead two looks from your right arm to the left leg, and it's looking at current. Any current that is positive or flowing towards a positive electrode is gonna produce an upwards deflection on your EKG. Any current that's flowing this way towards a negative electrode is gonna produce a downward current. So if we look here at this basic EKG, this is one pulse or one um, cardiac cycle. 
So each time your atrium and ventricles contract, this is what you should see. So that's one heartbeat. Y'all have probably seen this like on a video or something, uh -huh. but every single pulse, this is what you see. So the basic forms of this are going to be the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave, right? Again, we could talk about this for the next 24 hours if we wanted to. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep it at the level that probably high schoolers would care about. So the P wave represents atrial, bilateral atrial depolarization and contraction. So both atrium are contracting. And what happens, the P wave represents the current flowing through the atrium, causing the atrium to contract and empty into the ventricles. That happens during diastole because the ventricles are filling. Then the current flows down to the ventricles and that's when we see the current flowing and we get the QRS complex. So we see the current flowing through the ventricles like this, and now the ventricles are getting excited and they contract. And then the current goes back to the isoelectric line for a little bit. And lastly, we see the T wave. And the T wave is the recovery and the repolarization of those ventricles. So P wave represents atrial depolarization. QRS represents ventricular depolarization and contraction. And T wave represents the ventricular recovery. So I'll note just a couple of things about this. The P wave is much smaller than your QRS complex, right? Mm -hmm. The QRS complex looks really tall. The P wave looks really small. Why? Because the height of that EKG complex represents the voltage of current. The width of that complex represents the time it took to get that current to go through. So current that flows faster will give you a sharp boom waveform, whereas current that takes a long time will give you like a whoosh, like a more dome shaped, like a tombstone of a, um, of a waveform. So people who have ventricular dysrhythmias or, or abnormal current sometimes will have really weird QRS complexes that look what we call wide and bizarre mm -hmm. because it's taking longer for that current to flow through longer, but a normal QRS complex should be fast and a lot of voltage. So you see a sharp point for the atrium. The atrium has that really thin wall. Remember that picture of the heart I showed y'all has that really, really thin wall. And because of that, you need a lot less current flowing through there to cause atrial depolarization and contraction. So that's why it still takes about the same amount of time. So you can see the width of them is pretty similar, but the height is gonna be significantly lower because there's less voltage to cause contraction of the atrium than there is for the ventricles. Let me see how much time I have. Okay, so I wanna go, anything else you want to know about EKG? I'm gonna go a couple oh, slides great. back maybe MI. So I'll go back to M. I'll go to MI for a second because I think that's probably something most people have either heard of a heart attack, unfortunately known someone who's had a heart attack or had a grandparent or someone, who, a friend or someone who's, who's um, had a family member who's gone through that. So right. I just want to go through a little bit about what is an MI and what do we do about it? So first, I told you that your heart is a big old muscle. Mm -hmm. And muscles are made up of tissues and tissues are made up of cells and cells need oxygen to fuel all life sustaining processes. So who brings the oxygen to the cells? My coronary arteries, coronary. We think about coronary is just like a root word for cardiac. Okay. So coronary is talking about the heart. My coronary arteries are arteries that bring blood to my heart. So I told you that each red blood cell has 270 million hemoglobin molecules and all those hemoglobin molecules bind oxygen to actually deliver oxygen to the tissues. And the coronary arteries are the ones that reach deep into that ventricular myocardium to bring blood flow to those zones of the heart. So what if I have disease of my coronary arteries? Then I am predisposed to getting something called an MI or having undergoing an MI. Now I will say, there are five types of MIs and there are a lot of reasons you can have heart attacks, okay? So MI just being the clinical term for heart attack. So when I say MI, think heart attack. So the type one is the most common. And what happens is we develop something called atherosclerotic plaque. So we develop these fatty plaques within our coronary arteries. And in reality, we are not just developing plaque within our coronary arteries. We are developing plaque in every artery in our body but our heart is something that's very symptomatic and really needy. And he's gonna be dramatic when he doesn't get enough blood flow. So we, and, and it's also life-threatening. So an MI is a really big um, deal. Whereas when someone has like finger gangrene or doesn't get enough blood flow to their finger or something, they just, you know, we're less panicky about it, right? They'll have to go to surgery or something to, to reperfuse or bring better uh, blood flow to that area. 
So let's talk about these plaques. How do we get them? So if I'll show y'all on here, this is a, an example of atherosclerotic plaques. So how do we get them? Three primary things that I want y'all to know about. Um, one, hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Two, hyperlipidemia, which is elevated cholesterol and triglycerides. And three is going to be um, type two diabetes that's uncontrolled. Okay, those are a bit, there are more risk factors, but those are your three big, big common risk factors. They are the trio for vascular disease and they will kill you, right? It's really, they're really, really bad for you. Now, again, we have a lot of medications to manage these and a lot of lifestyle changes we can go through to try to minimize the impact of them and really improve and optimize the health of our bodies. But uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled hyperlipidemia, and uncontrolled type 2 diabetes is so bad for the vessels. There's no worse thing you could do to your body. Well, there, there are some worse things, but <laughs> those are very bad things we can do to our bodies, okay? So first, Hypertension, what does it do? It traumatizes the vascular endothelium or the inner lining of those blood vessels. It traumatizes them, makes them rough and coarse and predisposes them to plaque buildup. Hyperlipidemia, those elevated um, lipid levels flowing through that blood contribute to that plaque development. And then the big kicker, uncontrolled type two diabetes. And I, we don't have time to go through all of the pathophysiology of, of diabetes, but we know that diabetes, type two diabetes is gonna be characterized by insulin resistance and a lot of neurohormonal abnormalities that develop after that. So you have high levels of insulin and you also, if you're uncontrolled, are gonna have high levels of glucose as well. So hyperinsulinemia is high levels of insulin in your blood and hyperglycemia is high levels of sugar in your blood, okay? So hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia cause oxidative damage, which is essentially a series, and maybe y'all learned about this in your chem classes, a series of redox reactions, which are these little hydroxide molecules, which eat away and damage the tissue within that vascular endothelium. So what do you see? You end up seeing the result of that, which is these lipid plaques, and they have fatty foam cells and this thin little um, uh, membrane over these fatty foam cells. Um, at, let me just mention one more thing there's a lot of genetic predisposition to this too. So I say that because there are a lot of things in life that we can control and, and we can do, we could live perfectly, meaning all I eat is organic and like, I'm so healthy, not maybe not in real life, but like <laughs> we can do everything perfectly and exercise and watch what we eat and only, you know, consume the best foods ever. Um, and we could still have cancer or, or really bad diseases. So we have a lot of genetic predisposition to things. So I don't say this to say that, um, someone who has a heart attack hasn't taken care of themselves, right? right? Because there are a lot of, there's so, it's so multifactorial. However, what we can control, we should control to optimize our health, right? So I'm talking about the, um, the controllable risk factors, not the uncontrollable genetic predisposition, because all of us are going to have a genetic lineage of stroke or cancer or MI or something that, that, you know, we are just going to have a higher risk for than the person next to us. Um, and that's just something that we're born with. But there are a lot of things that we can work towards to improve health. So I just want to clarify that, that um, there are a lot of things we can do. Okay. So it's not like if there's a will, you won't, you won't um, have this. So with these plaque buildups, essentially what happens, you have this plaque in your vessels and we can see we have a narrowed opening for that blood to flow through. Then what can happen is for some reason that we actually don't understand yet, this little thin membrane above this ruptures. And when it ruptures, this coarse calcified plaque is exposed. And that plaque then starts to cause this inflammatory cascade, which causes platelet aggregation. So remember, when we have a, when we develop a clot, when I, if I scrape myself and I develop a clot, what happens is I get platelets that clump together, which are a little plugs kind of, and then I get the coagulation cascade, which activates, which creates fibrin, which is this mesh work that goes on top of the platelets. So what I like to remember it, uh, by simply is bricks and mortar. The platelets are the bunches of bricks that you stack to build a wall. And the um, fibrin is the mortar that you do to make that wall unbreakable. The first thing that happens though, is you get the bricks and you build your wall and then the mortar comes on. So um, in, our, in an MI, you have that plaque rupture and platelets start to aggregate. Those platelets clump and they can completely occlude this vessel. So now whatever zone of my heart is being supplied by that by that blood vessel is now not receiving any blood. And so I'm going to get tissue ischemia. 
Ischemia is the imbalance of oxygen demand and oxygen supply. But as ischemia progresses, you're going to get infarction. Infarction is tissue death, okay? And that's irreversible. What's interesting is we can develop as, as vessels narrow, because I don't go from one day having like perfect clean arteries to like tomorrow, some of them arteries are like plaque red because I ate McDonald's, right? right? This built up over years and years and years and years and years. So the slower I build up plaque, typically the more new circulation you build. So you will produce something called angiogenesis, which is new blood vessel formation. And this is one of the reasons that often your younger men who have heart attacks that they are at higher risk for death than your older men. So you will have, unfortunately, you will have friends whose dads die, but their grandfathers live from MIs. Um, and the reason is grandpa who had a stroke at 90, he was developing that plaque for the last 60 years. And so he had so many additional little blood vessels that were supplying that zone that when that one primary vessel completely occluded, I had 20 other tiny little blood vessels that were able to keep that tissue alive and minimize injury so I could get to the hospital and get reperfused versus someone who has a heart attack at 45 and they haven't had this slow progression and a lot of adaptation that our bodies go through and they will suddenly have a drop in blood flow, flip into a lethal rhythm or abnormal current in their heart or progress to a state of shock where their heart, suddenly that necrotic tissue, that dead tissue cannot pump the way it should, and they can fall over and target, right? Or fall over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's when we have to do CPR outside of the hospital, right? And bring them in through EMS. Um, so that's one of the, the unusual things or one of the diseases that you see your elderly survive often, um, more often than your younger people who end up having the heart attacks, um, which can be very tragic. I'll talk about one med that we give right away when someone's having a heart attack and that's a chewable aspirin. So um, what y'all could take for this is that um, we know the primary signs of heart attack, right? Chest pain. There are also a lot of other signs. You can have anxiety, you can have shortness of breath, you can have jaw pain, left arm pain. Women and diabetics are significantly more likely to present atypically. And a huge percentage of women, possibly up to 50% of women, do not even have any chest pain when they have a heart attack. They will have insomnia, they will have a lot of other symptoms, fatigue, um, poor appetite, GI upset, but won't have chest pain. And so what that can lead to is delayed diagnosis and delayed intervention for these people. But if someone does have risk factors for an MI, so let's say your uncle or someone is visiting and they suddenly have horrible chest pain and they have type two diabetes and hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, and they have crushing chest pain. What are you gonna do? You're gonna call 911, right? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna try to do some type of surgery at home in the kitchen because you watched me talk about it one time, right? Nothing you can do at home. You're calling 911, but what you can do is have them chew aspirin. So if y'all have aspirin in the house, um, they can chew 160 to 325 of aspirin. And that's what they'll tell you. The 911 operator will tell you that as well, but they chew it for faster onset of action. If you swallow it, the big ones, when you swallow them, they act over 24 hours because they have an enteric coating. Whereas the baby ones, you chew them, they're 81. So you could take two to four baby aspirins. And what aspirin does is it blocks platelet clumping. So you get bleedy, bleedy, right? Mm -hmm. the, the thing that, uh, the most common trigger for these MIs is that plaque rupture and platelet aggregation. So you chew that antiplatelet and you can help kind of block that platelet aggregation and possibly keep some of that vessel open or prevent complete occlusion of that vessel as they get transported to the hospital. So something kind of to know. And right. then um, how are we on time? We're, we're good. We're okay. okay. We're I'll go past, but good. <laughs> Okay, I'll go through one more thing with the intervention since I started at MI and then um, I'll see if there are any questions. Okay. So um, this is what we do in the hospital. We do something called a cardiac catheterization. So um, if, I, if we have a patient who has a massive MI, they come in and they have a blocked blood vessel. What do we need to do? We need to reopen that blood vessel, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? They are going to put a catheter and a catheter, think about like, a wire, it's thinner than this. This is my, my iPhone charger, but it's thinner than this, but it's something kind of like this. And they go either through your radial artery, which is right here, or they go through your femoral artery, okay? Which mm -hmm. is in your groin. And they thread that up all the way to your heart. And then they have you on like this big X-ray machine and they shoot dye from this little catheter. They'll shoot dye into your blood vessels. And when they shoot dye, they're viewing that, that um, dye through the, the X-ray 
and they can see where the blood vessel narrows. So I have a little picture of it here. They can see the blood surging through because the blood has died, right? Blood mm -hmm. surging through and suddenly narrowing. And they say, ah, there's the blockage that we're looking for, right? And then they thread that catheter all the way up to that blocked vessel and they'll place a stent. And a stent is a little drug eluding mesh coil that they'll place there. And that mesh coil helps keep patency or keep that blood vessel open. So it reopens that blood vessel and they'll shoot a lot of blood thinners through there too. And then that patient will typically go um, and they'll have to be on bed rest for a while afterwards to prevent bleeding from that insertion site. And we have a long nursing care to kind of watch that patient afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in essence what we do when someone comes to the hospital. It's very more complex than simple, simply that. But, <laughs> um, if you're curious what happens. So I'd love to open it up and I'll um, pop off this guy so that I, I can um, see if y'all have any questions before um, before I go. I want to invite any of the guests that are still with us. If you have a question, put it in the chat. But I have a question, okay. which is what are some of the best things you can do to improve lung heart function um, at any age? Very perfect. Exercise and diet are the basics, okay? So we always talk about primary prevention and secondary prevention and tertiary prevention, right? right? Primary prevention means before you develop a disease, try not to develop it, right? So you want to exercise. Exercise can look so different for different people, right? Um, so I like to do triathlons, but a lot of people don't like to. My husband can't <laughs> swim and hates to run, right? Um, and so he does strength training and biking. So we all can exercise in different ways. Um, there's so many fun creative classes like Zumba and different things that people can do, um, whether you're home and do virtual ones or whether you're outside or even enjoying going on a walk with your family, right? But doing something that gets your steps in, being more intentional about taking the stairs, doing things to keep your body more active, because the more active you are, the 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 greater improvement you are going to have in, in reducing your insulin resistance and preventing insulin resistance from developing. And then diet. We all know processed foods and processed sugar are so, so tasty, but also so not good for us, right? So our kids just had um, a Valentine's Day, yes. you know, they passed out all their Valentine's things. So I let them have like a, a piece of candy every day. But if they were to choose, they would eat that entire bag in one sitting, right? So sometimes as adults, we're like, well, we can choose, right? Mom's not telling me I can't eat it. Um, but we have to try to maintain some level of self-control. Right. And I think, again, everything in moderation, right? I love a Reese's Pieces. We all love to eat healthy or we all love to eat, eat some, some really good foods, but looking for healthier options, reducing your processed foods, um, good high protein diet, those healthy fats are so good. And mo those omega-3s are really, really good for your heart. Um, and then Secondary prevention is going to be screening and, and early identification of the diseases that you have. So go to the doctor, get your annual physical, um, get your blood work done, get your blood pressure checked. And if you have high blood pressure, think about what diet um, interventions, what exercise interventions you can do, and then what medications you may need if, if diet and exercise isn't enough. I don't believe that you just like throw a pill at everything, but there are a lot of things that we need medications for, and we have medications, and those prevent worsened and worsened diseases from developing. So I think sometimes there's this resistance to go to the doctor because you don't want bad news, but the news just gets worse the longer you wait, unless you go take care of it, address it. And the earlier you find these problems, the, the better your outcomes are going to be and the better you can address them. Um, so my best friend's um, dad was diagnosed with diabetes mm -hmm. and he just did this complete lifestyle change. And now he, his numbers are all perfect. He, he's completely doing lifestyle modifications, no uh, medication, no, nothing else needed. And it's just really cool to see he's, he's exercising every day. He's eating really well. And not everyone can do that, right? Again, we have right. a lot of genetic factors that influence that as well. But doing the best we can to make our lives um, healthy because what we put in and what we do with our bodies really affects our health. So that's great. Thank you so much. I want to thank of you course. for helping us today and telling us this of has course. been the most fascinating Probably oh. because I have someone in my life who's going through everything you just talked oh. about. So it was really great to hear it. I want to thank all our guests for joining us today. Yes, thank everyone you. have a great day. Enjoy this little bit of warm weather we're going to have over the next few days. And uh, we'll see you next month. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank you.